It's sounding fine today as well. Crystal clear. Hello and welcome to episode 181 of Heroes of Handheld. This is the internet's premium handheld gaming podcast dedicated to all things that you play with your fingers and your eyes. And uh, my name's Chris, his name's Colin. We're going to be talking Vita, 3DS, Switch, and a little bit of mobile news as well. Uh, how are you, Mr. Byrne? Are you right? I'm fine. It's so hot. I've got the window open, and I even enjoyed a Magnum earlier, a white oh, chocolate Magnum. I'm going to have some Ben & Jerry's after we're done. Now, honestly, like, I went to the shop, and like Ben & Jerry's was like four pounds. Well, no, it was on offer, but it was like three pounds still. Like a tub of Ben & Jerry's, you know, your fish food, your brownie, or whatever. But then like they had like a pack of four Magnums for like £1.99. Oh, I'm sorry, but there's no competition for it. Come on. Let's be honest. I've been, um, I, I tend to buy Ben & Jerry's when it's cheap and stock up, because, you know, sometimes it goes down to about two quid. Yeah, that's the time. And I've, I've got one on the go that's the peanut butter Reese's Cups. Oh. Have you had it? You know what? I used to not like peanut butter but ever so slowly i've started to you know like a little bit have a little bit of it but now i absolutely love peanut butter and that ice cream is amazing have you tried it's it really yet? yeah i'm kind of i really like the reese's bits that are in it but then the actual ice cream is we is weirdly it's very salty yeah but i guess mm. peanut butter is pretty salty anyway yeah, um, i think it's just like the whole flavoring of peanut butters in that ice cream isn't it it's just like an overall mm. peanut butter flavor but i think like you will think like oh i'm not that keen on this but you'll end up eating the whole tub and then you'll just keep buying oh yeah it. absolutely subconsciously um, reese's cups have, are gonna take over have you tried the magnum ice cream which comes with a shell that you have to crack no i've not tried that one i've seen it advertised but I don't, I've not seen it that cheap yet. It's like still what four or five quid, I think. Mm. Is that any good? Uh, well, I thought it was okay, but if you're really into your Magnum, uh, then you'll have to give it a try and let me know. We should do like an ice cream review. That would be great. That would be the best. One of my favorite ice creams is Ben and & Jerry's, and it's the core ones, where they have like that center, like gooey oh, center. Oh, yeah, like gooey, like a caramel aura. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the caramel choo-choo one. Oh, my. Oh, I could eat the whole tub. So, so good. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, enough about ice cream. Come on, let's get down to some important business. And that business is, I had five guys last Friday, and oh, I have no regrets. Boy. Yeah, because you just have one open up in Bournemouth, haven't you? Yes, yes. Um, I could, couldn't possibly comment on the one I went to, Christopher. Couldn't possibly do that. But in my local town, a five guys has opened, and after months and months of like anticipation, we went there on its opening day. I had the cheese and bacon burger with ketchup and mushrooms, the chips, and I didn't realize with their milkshakes, you pay a price and then you can have any amount, any combination you want of all these flavors. So mm. I had peanut butter, chocolate, and Oreo bits in my milkshake, and it was the best thing ever. It was so good. Five Guys is just incredible, and I can't believe there's one just down the road from me now. It's amazing. It was so busy though. It was absolutely manic. There's queuing. There's queues out the door all day. They must have made so much money, and it's been the same all weekend actually, all over the bank holiday. So popular, and I think there's one opening near you as well, isn't there? Yeah, I've just uh, I just saw that the um, so basically we had this local pub that shut down on Clapham High Street, and then for a little while the building was empty, and then Five Guys bought it, and now they've put all their signage up. Oh, it's so exciting. I'm mm. really because the thing is, it's right by the common, so everyone's going to get their burgers and sit and eat them in the grass. It's going to be like heaven. I love Five Guys. I think they're bloody great. It, they are the best. I don't like calling it fast food because that feels like an insult to them because it's just such good quality meat. But it's so good. It's a bit expensive, more expensive than like your normal burger take, you know, fast food. But it's so, so worth it. And honestly, like it just blow. It's like a different level to places like uh, McDonald's and places like that. It's just so good. If you've not tried Five Guys, that they seem to be opening loads of new restaurants around the country. So sure, and if you're in America, they're everywhere anyway. So if you have another Five Guys, you should do it. And if you're vegetarian, they've actually got vegetarian options. They they do a grilled a grilled sandwich for three quid. Grilled sandwich. That's so good. I'd love to try a grilled sandwich. Anyway, yes, enough of the food talk. Let's get down to business. And it's a sad day, Chris, because today is the day we say, well, actually it was yesterday, uh, we said farewell to the PlayStation 3. 
sad times because Sony has manufactured its final PlayStation 3 ever. So that's it. No more PS3s. It's all PS4s and PS4 Pros and whatever. Is it? What's the thing that Sony are doing? Is it the Scorpio? That's Xbox, uh, the, isn't it? It's the PlayStation. It's the PlayStation 4 Pro. Uh, that's but it. Is this, have they ceased production everywhere? Well, let's read this article and find out. Uh, it's been <laughs> a while coming. Um, so, I mean, I actually was a bit surprised when I found that they stopped manufacturing them, even though it's like, you know, last gen. It's not that old. Like, I, I would have thought they're still making, well, maybe I didn't think they're still making PS2s. But it seems strange that they'd stop. I guess they've got the PS4 Pro and the PS4 now, so I guess they don't really need to. Uh, but the PS3's trusty 500 gigabyte model has managed to stay in production more than three years since PlayStation 4. Has it been three years since the PS4 came out? No way. It's mad, isn't it? Three years. Crazy. So apparently in that time frame, they've continued to make the 500 gigabyte um, PS3s. Uh, it's an impressive extended lifespan, but nothing compared to the 13 year production run of the PS2. Uh, the PS3 first launched in November 2006 in Japan and North America, and then March 2007 in Europe. Was it really that much of a gap? So November 2006 for America and March 2007 for Europe. That's crazy. That's the PS3, months, yeah, there was a big jump, I remember. It's crazy. So it's been in production around 10 years and two months. Well, no, not in production. But that was 10 years and two months ago since it came out in Europe. That is insane. Uh, the console's European launch lineup included Motorstorm 3, Resistance Wall of Man, Ridge Racer 7, Virtua Fighter 5, and Call of Duty 3. Did you play any of those games, Chris? Yeah, I played Resistance and Motorstorm. Hmm. And what, what were the others? Uh, we had Ridge Racer, Virtua Fighter, and Call of Duty 3. Oh, I play Call of Duty as well. Um, yeah. res the first Resistance was really good. The co-op on that game was really fun. Didn't wasn't I played a bit of the second Resistance, I think, but it wasn't the ending really crap. Weren't people really unhappy with how the story ended? I swear there's something. Uh, people did this, like, something oh, about I can't remember the the first one. They changed characters, I think, at the end of the first one. Mm. Yeah, I and think then, that was um, it. Like like three different settings on all three games i seem to remember mm. so um yeah, yeah i mean they're all good fun though but um apparently 80 million ps3 consoles have been sold since launch leaving it almost level with the xbox 360 despite microsoft's console having got off to a far stronger start ps4 looks set to sell past ps3 sales however the console is already on 50 million sales with plenty of life left in it so there you go there's no more playstation 3s being production this is it no more they're all done the slim versions the big fat models they're all done so no more ps3 so it's now a vintage console so you'll probably see places like kex cx put the price up so for a ps3 it'll probably cost you about five thousand pounds now so yeah keep on keep hold of your ps3 people keep hold of your ps3s i just can't believe it's been three years since the um, ps4 came out that that really mm. is crazy i still remember when that was announced and like there was the big like war as to who's going to announce it first and Sony came out first, but then Xbox came out and actually showed you the console because they wanted to like be the first one, and everyone was like really disappointed because they're like a big old VCR player. And it was just like a big box, and it was like, what the hell is that? Oh, the backlash! Remember that E3 when Xbox did their present, Microsoft did their presentation, and they said like you can't, uh, you can, you can only share your game with one person in your family. You can't trade them in. It's locked to your console. You have to be online all the time. And that massive backlash they got, and then Sony yeah, was completely huge, wasn't it? blew them out the water of theirs, and it was that was hilarious to watch. That was great. People seem to forget about that now. Anyway, another quick thing. Uh, I mentioned Call of Duty. Well, a few weeks ago, we mentioned the fact that. Uh, the Modern Warfare remastered version um, initially only came out with the Legacy Edition of last year's Call of Duty, but now there's rumors. I mean, we're not surprised about this, but there are rumors that Modern Warfare remastered is going to be coming out as a standalone game. And it looks like uh, there's more fuel to the fire here because another listing has appeared on a Japanese website this time de detailing um, the Call of Duty Modern 4 remaster on its own. And it's saying about it being imported from North America. And it's saying the release date is June the 20th, 2017, which is not that long away. It's only a couple of weeks away now. Um, so Activision still haven't confirmed this, but it pretty much looks dead sir, dead on that we're going to be getting call of duty remastered as a standalone game so the big question now is just how much they're going to be selling it for 
you know mm. um, i was really be a, there, there must be a disc version of it coming as well uh i don't know it doesn't really say i'd, I'd imagine they probably would release it as both because it's uh i mean i can understand why they didn't release it like this initially because they wanted people to buy last year's call of duty you know it was a, a reason for people to buy the legacy edition and put down loads of cash for activision but i mean i don't know whether they left it a bit too late now like when they first announced modern warfare remastered there's so much buzz online so many people were excited because of course call of duty 4 you know one of the best uh, first person shooters ever made in my opinion and in a lot of people's opinion but now people seem to have just like forgotten about it and um you know I, i'm not too sure how well it's going to sell now but it's interesting that the release date is in a couple of weeks time i hope this is true because i would really like to play it i think I know it's probably not going to be this, but if it's around the twenty pound mark, I would consider it. But I can't help but think they're probably going to push it up to like a proper retail price, so maybe around forty quid. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised if they pushed it to forty and um, for or thirty five. But we wait and see. So no confirmation yet from Activision, but we've had a couple of leaks over the past few weeks. Loads of listings appearing online, so it looks like we are getting Call of Duty remastered. As a standalone game, which everyone is excited to hear because no one bothered to buy the Legacy Edition. I don't know. It'd be interesting to know how many copies, how many versions of the Legacy Edition were sold. It'd be really interesting to see that. I, I don't know how well it sold. And I don't think, as far as I'm aware, the Call of Duty from last year didn't sell as well as um, previous editions. But I, I've got no facts and figures to back that up. It's just what I believe. <laughs> it's, it's like an instinct, a natural uh, feeling I have in my gut. So, I mean, if it comes out, if it's 20 quid, I'd probably get it straight away, but if not, I would most likely wait till the price goes down. I think you said you wouldn't be too bothered about getting this, um, Chris, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah I'm not. Um, I mean, I would like to go back to a simpler time on Call of Duty, mm. but I also, I always pick them up with the best of intentions. Oh, your view is online. Then, uh, Sorry. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, I'm always going to, I'm going to play this forever and I'm going to get really good. And then like, I got quite good on some of them, but I do find them quite frustrating. Hmm. Yeah, they. Uh, it was much simpler, wasn't it? Though with COD Four, there was only three kill streaks, only a few game modes, nice and simple. Ah, oh, good times. Yeah, back in the day, what was it? It was UAV Harriet. No, it was UAV airstrike yeah, helicopter. Helicopter. That was it. Yeah. Bloody helicopter. Hated it. Anyway, uh, there's nothing worse than when like you've you're crap at Call of Duty like I was, and you battled so hard to get the seven kill streak to get the helicopter. It comes in, you see it appear on the map, and as it comes in, someone shoots it down with an RPG. There's nothing, there's nothing where it's like, ah, I'm so frustrating. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Chris, I know I put this article oh. into the um, the doc, but tell me about Pokeland or Pokeland. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to really know, but basically, uh, after the success of Pokemon Go and Magikarp Jump and... Uh, the other Pokemon title that I can't remember that came out on mobile, uh, the Pokemon company have confirmed that Pokerland is coming, and it looks a lot like the Pokemon Rumble games. Uh, I don't know if you've played much of those, which are these kind of strange art styles where the Pokemon look like wind-up toys. Uh, this is a new app that's coming out to iOS and for Android. Um, it's kind of, yeah, mostly being compared to Pokemon Rumble. It uses your Nintendo account as well, so you can log in. Uh, there's an Android-only test happening in Japan. Um, and there's apparently over a hundred types of Pokemon in the game as well, which is pretty good for a mobile one. Um, it looks like the alpha is uh, running until June the 9th in Japan. Yeah. And uh, no idea on whether it comes west, but I mean, you would assume so because the Pokemon company enjoy money. Um, it looks really, like, it looks quite interesting. Uh, I mean, they're, they're obviously trying, Nintendo is and Pokemon are clearly trying so many different ideas for their handheld games because don't forget we've had Fire Emblem this year, uh, we've got an Animal Crossing game and potentially a Zelda game this year later on as well to come Mario um, Run. and Mario Run, yep mustn't forget that, so they're obviously trying lots of different things, uh, but Pokemon Rumble's been pretty, I think fairly popular, uh, there was the one on there was a free to play one on 3DS, there was one on the Wii as well, uh, we'll put some screen grabs in uh, I know Magikarp Jump is fairly popular. Um, That's the big thing at the moment, isn't it? Magikarp Jump. Actually, uh, hang on, because Magikarp. Emma's in the room and Emma's been playing Magikarp Jump. Emma, give us a thumbs up. Is Magikarp Jump any good? 
Oh, it's a middle. Oh, you won't commit. It's like a wavering middle thumb. Oh. <laughs> uh, so maybe Magic Up Jump isn't the one, but this does look quite good. This is called Poker Land. Uh, is Magic Up Jump actually made by the Pokemon Company? I think so. I mean, it's it's like an official Pokemon title. Yeah. Looking at um, pictures, yeah, people weird. seem really into it. Um, I don't really know too much about it, but anyway, yes. Uh, I would imagine this will come in June, in um, June, July time. I think it will come in early summer. Uh, but I guess watch this space. We'll embed some screen grabs as well so you can take a little look-see. Tell me about Sonic Mania, because I heard about this as well, and I'm very pleased about the news. I love Sonic. I love Sonic games. He can do no wrong, in my opinion. I well, liked I liked Sonic Unleashed, right? I liked the Werehog. He was great. He was great. Oh, I forgot about the Werehog. He was brilliant. He was so cuddly and lovely. Oh, I loved yeah. it. They did that whole. They did like a Sonic trilogy for for that era, didn't they? Because it was the Werehog one. Yeah. And it was the one when he had a sword. Oh, the the, the Black Knight or something. So, Sonic and the Knight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like Dark Sonic or something. That was a Wii game, I think. That was that just came out on Nintendo device. I think like yeah. each uh, different consoles got different games. I think Sonic Unleashed was a PS3, 360, and uh, I don't know if that came out on Wii as well. I have to double check. But I like Sonic Unleashed, and a lot of people don't like the 3D area of the Sonic games, but I love them. They're fine. So tell me about Sonic Mania. Tell me all about it. Sonic Mania is uh, a new edition in the Sonic title, and we have a. It's kind of. It's fairly retro style, to be honest. We finally have a release date of August 15th, which is uh, a couple of days after my birthday. Yay. There's a new trailer, which you can watch. Uh, we'll embed on the uh, Heroes of Handheld.wordpress.com website. You can play as Sonic, Knuckles, and indeed Tails. It's that 2D style. But here's the cool thing, Colin Byrne, mm -hmm. because I always. I, I'm never really that into Sonic. I find them annoying, if I'm Blossoming. honest. And I Blossoming. find it uh, I find it too fast for its own good. Right. And I think also I get annoyed at how ex like the fact they charge a full price for these games. But it looks like the new Sonic Mania will cost you a mere $20 if you download from the eStore. It's coming out to uh, PS4, Switch, Xbox, uh, other platforms as well. We'll embed this really cool animated trailer, which I would really recommend taking the time to watch because it's uh, really pretty. And yeah, twenty. I feel like $20 seems like a good price. I don't know about you. That is, good. that is a good price, especially for the Nintendo Switch version, which you'd think they'd put it at a proper retail price, wouldn't you? But yeah, yeah. I think, looking at the discussion online, people are happy because they're thinking that maybe they've taken some, they've taken feedback from the pricing of, I think, it was it Street Fighter? Or a, a new Street Fighter that came out for yeah, Switch? Yeah, Street Fighter 2's just been re re, re Yeah, wasn't the price, like, ridiculous? Wasn't it, like, 40 quid or something? A lot of people I think it was that. a little pricey for yeah. an older game, yeah. yeah I, can't, I don't quite know. So 20 quid or $20 is a very good price. And when's this coming out? Switch? Have we got a release uh, date? I think you August might. 5th, August 15th. And that's the Switch release date. Yeah, that's everything's really set apparently. Oh man, like the reasons to get a Switch are increasing for me. We've got Sonic, we've got Skyrim coming out, we've got Mario Odyssey, we've got Mario Kart. Honestly, how, how's your Switch? You got been? your old pal Chris. Yeah, how's it been? Old, uh, you still enjoying it? I've been, yeah, I've been really enjoying it. I've been playing uh, a surprising amount of time docked on the TV, which I didn't really expect. Has it warped um, yet? Has it, have you noticed any warping? No warping issues to report. No Joy-Con yeah. syncing issues to report. I've played mostly Zelda. Uh, I've played a bit of Snipper Clips, which I quite like, but that's because I'm very patient. And people that I've played with seem to find it quite frustrating. I don't know if that's just because I'm quite thick and hard to play with. What's it called? Um, it's, called it's called Snipper Clips. It's a co-op yeah. game where you play as these uh, shapes. And you have to work with your teammates to cut them into a shape, which is useful for this kind of selection of puzzles. It's cute. It's it the type of cute. game where you could see why people would get frustrated with me on it. Um, <laughs> and it's like when you're watching people who can't work out how to do it, it's frustrating as well. But it's really sweet. And it's only it's like less than 20 quid. It's got you can play with up to four of you as well, which I haven't tried yet. Uh, the two players pretty sound. Uh, I played a bit of Mario Kart. I played some online. I've played some battle mode as well, which is the new battle mode, which is very good. But Zelda, man, good. Zelda is so good. Mm. And I was, I've like the Zelda games that I've loved, I've really loved. And the Zelda games I've not enjoyed that much, I've been quite quick to dismiss. But this is like really good. And it, as soon as you complete the introduction, it just feels like you're in this giant like playground. You just yeah. get, you get basically in the first, um, on the first zone, you're working to unlock a uh, device that will let you kind of leave this higher ground 
and safely descend to the rest of the game world. Yeah. Uh, and it's just so good because as soon as you get down there, everyone's doing different things. Like some people are like, I'm trying to find really cool weapons. Uh, Rob, who's playing it, is getting really into like the cooking meta game and trying to make money from cooking. Um, different people will take it at their own speed, but it's such a brilliant game. And it's so full of surprises. And it's such a, for a world which I was worried would feel really empty, just feels so consistently full. And every time you turn a corner, you find something else interesting happening. Have you skydived and landed on a horse yet? I've not got a horse yet, no. no. Right, okay, so you're failing, basically. Well, no, it sounds amazing. And wh what I'm hearing from people and everyone's thoughts is, like, you can take it at any pace you like. Like, there's no real... Uh, well, obviously, there's urgency, but, you know, if you want to just avoid the main main plot for ages and just do side yeah, missions, you can. Some, yeah, I mean, so nice. I, rec I reckon... I reckon at least fifty percent of people won't do that. Won't finish the game. Won't do like the last story mission. But only because it's such a big world, and you can really like take so much into it. There's so much like collecting and puzzling and battling to do. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, sounds cool. Actually, very quickly talking about RPGs, I finally started playing Mass Effect Andromeda on my Xbox oh, yeah. One, and I am liking it so far i've probably played about two hours maybe just a bit over that um i don't know i don't know whether it's just me and how i play these games but i feel a lot of pressure when i'm playing it like you know you know when you start an rpg and you do the introductory level and you get introduced to people one by one then you slowly it gets explained to you what you have to do but then when you're put into the main game world do you ever find you suddenly get like loads and loads of side missions coming at you left right yeah. and center Wherever and the, you... the worst thing on that is if you've bought like the dlc pass as well so like if you've got the game of the year edition of fallout you uh, you leave the vault and you get like eight different missions pop up on your on your thing that are like, oh, why don't you go over to the to the rocket ship that's landed? Yeah. Oh god. Honestly, I hate it because I feel so much pressure. I'm the sort of person when I'm given the mission, I feel like I have to do it as soon as possible. So mm -hmm. like I could be on a mission to save the world. Like it could be the last mission, need to save the world. Oh no, there's an and NP, what's it called? Non-playable character. NPC. NPC. Who wants to go buy get buy some flowers for them? I've got I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I can't just leave it. And I'm feeling like an immense pressure at the moment because I I did the first level. I got put on the Nexus, which is the main hub ship, a bit like the Citadel from the original Mass Effect series. And straight away, I've been asked to try and find out whether I've I've got a, like a crying wife whose husband's been arrested for a crime he didn't commit. I've been told to go find minerals for a ship. I've been told to go find a missing ship that's been lost in space somewhere. I've got to go to a planet and set up a uh, a, a recon and throw drones every. Honestly, it's been at me and i'm sort of feeling overwhelmed already and i feel like the pressure is on um i don't know how i feel yet about the game it is very mass effecty obviously it's got the same um you know talking to characters like dialect dialect sort of thing um the same movement the same you know similar ways in how you pick up things and interact with characters and do missions and things like that but there's something missing at the moment and i'm not too sure what it is um i feel a bit it feels like it feels like it's very empty like there's not much heart in it at the moment like it's an interesting story it's really interesting what they're doing the characters i've met so far are interesting um i haven't really had much chance to you know get to know the characters oh. yet but i don't know i i'm going to stick with it because i i played it for the first time and then i stopped playing it i thought oh, that was all right but then i suddenly had a nagging sensation in my head i was like i want to get back into this world i want to keep exploring and so I went back and I played it for another couple of hours. And yeah, it's I'm not as absorbed as I was with the other Mass Effect games yet, but it's early days, so I'm going to stick with it and see where it goes. I've already explored a few planets. And uh, you remember from Mass Effect 2 where you could throw drones and um, probes onto planets to get resources and things yeah, like that? Yeah, you went that. kind of mining for stuff, didn't you? That's back again in this one. And oh boy, I'm enjoying it. It is. I don't know. I think it's quite a, a cool little puzzle, a little, um, not puzzle, a little mini game in it. I, I liked it. A lot of people didn't like the basic how basic it was, but... 
I thought it was cool. Um, what else can I say on it? The villain, the, the villains in it are interesting. We don't know much about them yet, but they a bit they are cool. Um, and just like you know, the more you walk around and the more you actually listen to conversations and get up data pads and listen to audio recordings, you learn more about uh, the world and what's happened because you, your character's been asleep for about six hundred years in whatever it's called Cairo sleep or whatever it's called when you put in a pod and go on a long journey. So it's interesting to hear what's happened in that six hundred years. And let's just say, not it's not gone smoothly. Let's just say that it's, it's not been a good trip. But a highlight so far was right at the beginning. You're exploring a character's um, chambers because you need to find some clues about what happened to them and things like that. And you find a recording. I don't know. I don't want to say much more, but you hear a familiar voice you may recognize from a previous installment of the game. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's them. It's them. So, yeah, I'll let you try and figure out who it is when it's 600 years in the future. Who could it be? Who could it be? Anyway, right. So it's good. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm going to keep playing it and hopefully... I will end up loving it. I don't love it at the moment. I like it. It's interesting. But we'll see where we go. We'll see where Question, we go. Question, Colin. Yes. How does it compare to the other R RPG? Sorry? The you, you other could... RPG you've been playing this week, Oceanhorn. Now, Oceanhorn, now I would have played it more, but I've lost my Vita. I, I don't know where my Vita's gone. Honestly, like I only ever have it in my flat, which is my flat consists of three rooms, and I've lost my Vita. I have no idea what's happened. It's it's nowhere. You know, I don't know if you have this, Chris, but where you have certain items that you'd only use in specific locations where you live. Yeah, and yeah. I, I've searched all these locations and it's not there. I don't know what's happened. I, I'm going crazy. But anyway, from what I play, I've been playing Oceanhorn, which is a game that originally came out to iOS, um, iOS and Android and came out on PlayStation Vita very recently. Um, it's a RPG in it. I'll say this straight off the bat. It is an absolutely gorgeous game. It plays so well on the PlayStation Vita. There's no frame rate issues at all. It's quite a big game. There's quite a big world to explore. There's no frame rate issues. It's a lot of fun. And yeah, it's just a great... It, it, this shows you how ports should be done. On the on PlayStation Vita, we've had examples of very poor ports over the years. I mean, Borderlands Two is probably the biggest example of that, where it was like basically your character was traveling through gravy or custard for most of it because it was so slow and like you'd shoot your gun and it'd freeze for like two minutes. Similar to the Walking Dead game on the Vita as well, but then that was the same for Telltale's Walking Dead. Wherever you played it, there was lag and things like that. Uh, so anyway, this game, Oceanhorn, Monster of Uncharted Seas, is out on PlayStation Vita. Um, quick overview of the story. You play as a young boy who becomes an adventurer. He goes on a quest to find out what's happened to his father, who's... Um, been well we don't know what's happened to your dad is he been killed is he still out there is he trapped but your the whole point of the story is you have to find a massive huge sea monster called ocean horn and hopefully when you find ocean horn everything will start to make sense you'll realize what's happened to your dad and what's happened to the world but in terms of the gameplay, you explore loads of islands around this world and you sail between these islands as well. And you have to um, collect things, you have to do missions, you have to defeat enemies to get gems to level up, to get more equipment. Um, you have to, in each island, there's certain missions you have to do. Um, there's like three or four, of, it depends on the island, but you go to these islands, you have to find certain areas, you have to complete the missions, and then you level up, and then it goes on from there. And the more you talk to people in the world, the more you find out about the map. And if you hear in conversation, like someone mention an island, if they say, oh, the other day I went to the Grand Island, as soon as they mention it, that island will appear on your map. So oh, you have cool. to talk to more people and then you learn about new places and you can explore them. It's just a stunning game. It's really bright. It's a, it's a lovely blue. The, the sea is all around you. It's a, a beautiful blue color. The lands are green and lush. The character models are really cool. It's a cartoony animation style, but it really, really suits it. It's really interesting. It's fun. It's addictive. I couldn't stop playing it when I had my PlayStation Vita. Um, I've played probably about three or four hours so far, and I want to sink a lot more hours into it because I'm really, really into it. Um, negatives, negativity about it, it's not much really bad stuff to say apart from a frustrating game element, which is where um, your character can't jump at all. So if there's a really a very slight incline or a slight ledge 
you can't go up. So you have to either find ladders or um, stairs to get up to higher places. You can't just like climb up at all or jump, which is annoying. Um, there's mini puzzles you have to do as well, which at the moment are quite easy and quite simple, but I'm assuming as I get further through the game, it'll get a bit tougher. And uh, yeah, I'm just... Re- what I love is just exploring this world and learning about um, you know, the different characters and the different things. And by t- reading journals and reading books and diary entries, you find out more about what's happened in the world and why this this beast ocean horn has appeared and how there's other ones and how it all started. So it's a fantastic game. I'm loving it so much. Definitely check it out. It's the perfect PlayStation Vita game, in my opinion, because it just plays so well. It looks great, and it's the perfect pick-up-and-play game. Like You can do a few missions, you can pause it, you can um, put your Vita to sleep and pick it up again and just continue where you left off. It's a great game. Check it out. It's called Oceanhorn Monster of Uncharted Seas. And if you haven't played it, don't play it on iOS, don't play it on Android. If you haven't played it before, play it on Vita, because so much better on Vita. And that's a fact. Knowledge is the bomb. So yeah, two games have been playing this week and enjoying both of them, but both of them very engaging and very fun. Right, that's my reviews done. That is my boy. reviews done. There you go. Well, you say, that's what I love about the PlayStation Vita. Like, I, I find like with my Xbox One, it's hard to find time to you know just sit down, turn on the Xbox and play a game. But when it's like a handheld game like Oceanhorn, you can just play it wherever you are. You can play it on the toilet, in bed, anywhere. You know, mostly on the toilet, but you get the idea. Um, that's why I love the PlayStation Vita. Just play it wherever you go. Anyway, anyway, Chris, did you know that the reason why there is a Nintendo Switch shortage is because Apple are trying to sabotage Nintendo? I mean, I have always suspected that, Colin, but it's good well, to have you say it. Well, this is actually according to the Wall Street Journal's Tokyo-based tech correspondent, Takayashi Mushizuki, which I'm sure I'm saying right. Um, he said the competition for components required to build the console is partially to blame. Uh, however, it's not traditional rivals like Sony and Microsoft that Nintendo is battling for supplies. According to the report, Apple is gobbling up the pu- uh, sorry gob- gobbling up the same parts required to build the Switch. Um, M- Mushuki says the LCD s- display are among the parts Nintendo is struggling to pr- procure, while the motors required for the Joy-Con HD rumble feature are also proving hard to come by. Um, the reporter also spoke with Toshiba, who, s- who said demand for the I think it's NAND rather than NAND. The N the NAND flash memory technology has been overwhelmingly greater than supply, and the situation is likely to stay for the rest of the year. So apparently, companies such as Apple, Google, and Amazon are trying to lock down like and get as much of these flash memory, the flash memory technology as possible. So the other companies can't use it, which means Nintendo are struggling to get parts, which means they're struggling to make new Nintendo switches. But apparently, uh, however, it's, it's not all doom and gloom because the situation promises to improve for switchless gamers with Nintendo reportedly committing to doubling production for the coming year. I think you've got more details on that. Uh, yeah, so it seems like Nintendo are finally aware that there's actually an issue with uh, with their production. Uh, but I mean, I don't know about you. Well, I know you've not uh, gone to try and find one, but I was surprised. Like at first glance, they seem like they're really hard to get, but certain shops seem to have loads of stock. But anyway, um, so lots of lots of uh, websites are reporting this. Uh, and it looks like the Nintendo company are hoping to sell 10 million units by the end of the console's first year, uh, which is mm, still nine months away, I suppose. Um, yeah, and the Wall Street Journal have said that they're, the company are looking at trying to just generate more and kind of capitalize on the hype because they obviously realize that uh, it's such a popular time. They're hoping to double production of the Switch and make it 16 million uh, in this financial year. Uh, so you know they'll, they won't sell all those, but still, it's very interesting um, that they know it. Uh, if you actually want to read the full article from Takashi Mochikuzi on the Wall Street Journal website, you can't. You have to pay for it, but there's a little preview which tells you everything you need to know. Beautiful. Uh, this, yeah, it's been. Um, there is some. There's, a, oh, there's loads of switch. News. There's actually just loads of news this week in general. Um, another good bit of switch news, which has flared up, is that the release of Monster Hunter XX is heading for Japan. Now, Colin, mm. I know you're not a big Monster Hunter fan, mm. but 
but you surely must see the appeal for a Monster Hunter game to come to Switch and three and uh, for it to be playable on your big telly and then on the go as well. Because so surely. many people play these games together. And here's the genius thing: the 3DS version can play with the Switch version. Whoa! What? Yeah. How? How does this That's work? So cool. So you'll be able to play with your pals. We've already got Monster Hunter XX or X or whatever it is. How work, Chris? Tell me, how does the technology work? I don't know. I, I think it's Wizards. Uh, but yes. there's a trailer on our website which you can watch. It looks, I mean, it looks really cool. I don't think, I, I can't remember. I get confused, but I don't think Monster Hunter X came west. And this isn't confirmed for the west yet, but uh, watch this space. Oh, I can't remember. Did it come west? Uh, I got confused and lost in the Japanese. Um, want to release this. It happens all the time. You got lost in all the anime boobs. It happens. It happens. Uh, yes, yeah, so Monster Hunter X. Oh, I don't know. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the thing is with Switch is it's region free, isn't it? So if you can speak Japanese, you could get this game and uh, bring it over, I guess. Yeah, do it. Um, Let's put the sub subtitles on. Surely they have English subtitles. Maybe not. I don't Maybe know. not. Actually. Why is it so dark in your flat? Well, for some reason, it's weird. It's a weird phenomenon, Chris. Apparently, the sun goes down every evening. I don't know if you've. Um, oh. I don't know if that happens in London because I think you just have an eternal blood moon, don't you? Yeah, it's just an eternal orange glow outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually got quite dark, so we should probably like hurry up and wrap this up. Okay, uh, let's. Late. Do you want to? I'll do. I'll ram through my 3ds news, and then you can do your Vita news if you'd like. Well, I want to tell you about my Vita news first because I've got the article ready to go, and it's all about Minecraft. Everyone loves Minecraft. It's on the Switch. It's on iOS. It's on every device you could pos possibly fathom. It's on. But we're focusing on the PlayStation Vita version because an update is being released, and this has come to Europe and Japan, and North America is getting it later today. So actually looking at when this article was written, uh, North America got it yesterday. Uh, no, sorry, North America got it today, and Europe and Japan got it a couple of days ago. So this update adds a free glide track, support for the Adventure Time and Magic the Gathering packs, and Magic much, the Gathering much more. in Minecraft. There you go. Well, it's not Magic the Gathering. It's Adventure Time and Magic, semicolon, The Gathering. So I think no. it's just Adventure Time. Yeah, it's Adventure, Adventure Time and Magic, semicolon, The Gathering. Oh, and now I want Minecraft. Do you like Adventure Time, then? I, I like Magic the Gathering. You know I do. You know I'm sick for it. I don't think this is Magic the Gathering. It is. Magic the Gathering comes to Minecraft. It's on the website. Oh, my God, it looks so good. <laughs> what is Magic the Gathering? Is this something I should know about? I feel a bit. I feel a bit it's, sad. It's that, it's, it's a exist. it's a card game. Oh right, you're one of those, are you? You're one of those people. Oh my god, this Double looks that. so cool. Magic the Gathering. I'm googling it. Here we go. Magic the Gathering is a trading card game created by Richard Garfield, first published in 1993. Well, there you go. Why is it still popular if it was done in 1993? Tell me that. Why? Just why? This is dope. So the Adventure Time mashup packs coming out, the Magic the Gathering skin pack. Uh, they've also added Temple with a free glide track, as we said. Um, the default controls have been changed slightly. They've added pick a pick block, offhand slot for maps and arrows. So loads of other things have been added. We'll put a link to this article in the um, article for this week's podcast. But there's been loads of new additions, loads of bug fixes. So that's all very good. And there's also a trailer here for the Magic the Gathering pack. So I'm sure Chris will like milk himself over this, but we'll put this um, trailer in the article for this week's podcast. You can have a look at the Adventure Time and the Magic the Gathering packs as well. There you go. Uh, right, Chris, what have you got for me? I'm going to turn the lights on whilst you talk. So there are three bits of big 3DS news this week, and I will tackle them in reverse order. Uh, first of all is that Fire Emblem Warriors, which is coming out on Switch and 3DS, um, new 3DS even, later on this year in fall. There's loads of new details about this game, which is going to feature lots of new characters, including Shion, Lian, Darius, and Yuana. Uh, there's lots of legacy Fire Emblem characters to come as well. Um, this is in the same vein as Hyrule Warriors, which came out last year. We'll embed a link to this article, which is on RPGsite.net, which they've done all the translation work. Um, yeah, it's from Famitsu. It looks really cool. I'm well on board with this. Um, I mean, I love Fire Emblem, but I really like the Hyrule Warriors sort of vibe. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. But speaking of Fire Emblem, uh, you know, you may or may not know, Colin, that Fire the people who make Fire Emblem 
Uh, also, were very popular for making a game series called Advance Wars. Oh, Advance Wars! I know this. Did that you, was cool and, um, game. Advance Wars. Ah uh, ha Advance Wars came out for Game Boy Advance, and it was a DS one. Quite a few as well. The last one was in two thousand and eight. Would you believe it? Um, and basically, uh, Hitoshi Yamagami has done an interview of Eurogamer, which we've we've uh, linked to on our website. And basically, the um, reason they're not doing advanced ones anymore is because they really like the kind of characters and relationship drama that you get with Fire Emblem, and they're not really sure how they can translate that into an Advance Wars game. But I I loved Advance Wars. I mean, it was so um, stre- strategy, but with a different style to Fire Emblem, and it was so much more about like domination and making these big sweeping moves, and it's like I really miss it. I think it would really suit the Switch, and it would really suit 3DS as well if they were ever to do one, uh, but it looks like there's nothing kind of planned, but hopefully there'll be one in the future. I imagine there'll be one for Switch, to be honest, before the day is out. I like these big tank warm wars I'm seeing when I search mm. advanced wars. There's a big old tank face-off on one of the images here. Looks pretty cool. Your, uh, your final bit of 3DS news, which I don't really know too much about, but looks kind of interesting anyway, uh, is that a game made by Natsumi Inc. Um, is coming to 3DS called River City Rival Showdown. It's not coming 3DS title with local multiplayer. Uh, you take on familiar faces from the River City series and uh, meet new ones as well in a beat-em-up RPG. It's going to be playable at E3 as well, so do keep your eyes pe- peeled for that. Um I don't know this, but it looks like River City is pretty popular, and it's good that it is coming out uh, over here as well, North America around Europe. We'll embed some tweets so you can read more about that. Natsumi Inc. are the same people who are uh, working on the Harvest Moon titles that's out soon as well, I believe. I think hmm. they are anyway, actually. Natsumi Harvest Moon. Uh, Chris Google something on a computer. Sky Tree Village. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Colin, yeah. Uh, tell me what's happening with your Vita. Well, for those of us who want to find a Monster Hunter substitute, you would know that Koi Tepco's Tukidan 2 is probably the closest you're going to get to a Monster Hunter game on PlayStation Vita. And guess what? Tomorrow, which is today actually, today you can get Tukidan 2 for free on PlayStation Vita. The publisher will launch Tukidan 2 free alliances for both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, essentially acting as a trial version for the full game. Players can take on a selected pool of missions, teaming up with friends who also have free alliances downloaded, as well as those who own a copy of the game. Those who decide to upgrade to the full version can do so, importing their saved data and carrying on from where they left. It's a smart move from Koi, uh, Koi Tepkem, uh, I can never say their name, Koi Tecmo, and one that follows their recent free-to-play efforts with Dynasty Warriors 8, Empires, and Dead or Alive 5, which is the game of all the boobies. Uh, if multiplayer action RPGs are your thing, then Chikidan 2 is definitely worth a try, expanding on the original game with a new open-world focus. So yeah, if you want to try it out, you can play it for free today. So no excuse, go get Chikidan 2. And it's really cool that you can play with people who have the full game, or just have the demo version as well. That's a really nice touch. So a good move from uh, Koi Tecmo there. So that's free from today, and it's called Two Keaton Two. And the version you're looking for is Free Alliances. So go and download it today. It's free, and that's a great price. You know, free is good. You don't have to spend any of your hard-earned cash. You can save that for Five Guys and milkshakes. Mm. Oh boy, that is it. That is all I've got for you. Um, whilst we're whilst we're talking, Colin, mm-hmm. I, we we don't really do this. We don't tend to talk about other games podcasts that often because obviously yeah. we're the only one on the internet. But yeah. if we weren't, uh, I wondered if I could make a brief recommendation, right? Which is uh, this new series that have launched from a bunch of ladies in America. It's called What's Good Games. Uh, they've launched a Patreon, and they've, they're a couple of episodes into a podcast series. Uh, it's kind of like a weekly panel show uh, with sort of a, a kind of nice variety of topics. But I just wanted to... The thing is, I, I wanted to mention them because I feel like some... I listen to some games podcasts, and we're not guilty of this, but some games podcasts can be really, like, combative, and people are just trying to like score points and be the funniest. Uh, whereas I listened to the first episode of this series, What's Good Games. I just thought it was so good. It's made up of a team um, who various members used to work at uh, Polygon, IGN, Game Trailers, uh, 
and kind of various online writing and video games and it's just really like it's really nice atmosphere it's really good atmosphere i just wanted to sort of recommend it really Mm. i think you'd i think you'd like it as well and i think also just it's really refreshing to hear a series which has got so many female voices in Mm. um which i guess we can't really talk too much about but it's just i just thought that was a really nice move from a, from from these ladies to form this company it's really cool and yeah. uh yeah do have a listen i'm looking on their patreon now um we've got 771 they've got 4933 per month that's pretty good going that's really good um yeah it'd be interesting i mean this it's having a yeah I've, I've not even heard of this so i'm always looking for new podcasts i might check this out have you you listened to a few of them have you listened yeah to and it's just it's a really it's a really good atmosphere and um i just feel like it's really nice to have voices that aren't trying to dominate a conversation i think yeah um i just yeah i just would really recommend it i think people should really give it a try and also there's a real level of uh, of expertise there. I think they really know their stuff, and they've got really good kind of genre coverage. Whereas, they know their stuff, yeah, yeah, because you know, sometimes on these podcasts, um, yeah, it's, it's just good. It's just good. So I'd recommend that. Um, what else was I gonna? I was gonna. Um, oh, You're I can't going remember. to tell you... me about your experience with a raccoon. Have you seen no, that? They... I've never seen a. Ra- I've never seen a raccoon in real life. I have. I saw one at Disney. Well, as, a wild one. Yeah, wild well, one. Well, we, well, I assumed it was wild. As we were um, our last day at the Animal Kingdom, we looked. There's like a big river that goes through the center of it, and there was a raccoon on the riverbank. Cute little thing. Cute little. Uh, oh, there we go. Scams. And do you know at the California World of Adventure Disneyland, they've changed the Tower of Terror to a Guardians of the Galaxy ride. You yes, do. I've seen the video. It looks it really looks, cool. It looks so good. I really want to go. It looks really fun. I mean, Tower of Terror was a great ride anyway, but Guardians of the Galaxy, I, I watched um, the queue is just as cool because the whole storyline is that the Guardians are trapped in the Collector's Edition. Um, collector's um, his big whatever collection and you walk for, as you go through the queue there's loads of like little um references to other marvel films the comic books it's really cool there's like little things in like different glass cases like suits from films characters i think um howard the duck is in one of them as well but it looks really cool so uh yeah if you want to go to disney world go to disneyland in california and try the guardians of the galaxy ride because i want i want people to tell me how it is if it's good or not i'm sure it is good but i really want to go guardians of the galaxy is amazing it's a great idea. Anyway, let's go. Let's hey, be done. Uh, have, a, have a good week. Enjoy your ice cream, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, next week, we'll be back with episode 182, which is going to be chock block full of stupid Blink-182 references. I'm feeling this. I am What's feeling that? this. Oh, no, it was Green Day that did that acoustic song you used to always play, wasn't it? you love that one don't you where do we go from here i'm feeling this what else have they done the running down naked down the street that was them wasn't it uh yeah it was uh uh i need to think one more song before we end what do we what do we end oh oh uh uh i miss you That's the best I could come up with. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it was all the small things. That was their big one, wasn't it? All the small things. Small uh, things. And there was also Girl at the Rock Show. I'll see you at the Rock That's Show. A I fell in love with the Girl at the Rock Show because she's so cool. I tell her that I didn't know. Anyway, thank you for listening, everybody. Find all our previous episodes on heroesofhandheld.wordpress.com. Find us on Twitter at Handheld Podcast. Just search Heroes of Handheld on iTunes and Stitcher and all other podcasting places, and you can find all our episodes and all our details and everything worth knowing. Thank you to the Schnauzer Radio Orchestra for providing the theme song, and thank you, Christopher, for being beautiful as always. You're welcome, Colin, and uh, have a nice week, everyone. And hey, this time next week will be the day before the polls open, which is exciting. Very exciting. Slash terrifying. That is just... Yeah, so it's not actually an important day at all, because it's the day before anything actually happens. <laughs> so great. Which is annoying, because then when we record episode 183, we'll be like a week since the vote, and we'll be o- over it by then, and we won't even care. Mm-hmm. But Chris, I'll leave you with this before we end the podcast.
I need a dramatic ending here. There's one thing to think about before we end this podcast. What about the droid attack on the Wookiees? God's sake. Bye.